Hello, I'm Cynthia Raleigh, and I'm an author. I write genealogical mysteries, and I've started a new series called The Lantern Ordinary Witches, which is about a witch, a real witch, who's living in uh, Connecticut in North America in 1660. And I also do have a true crime nonfiction book, but most of my books are in the other two series. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about witchcraft in colonial America. And I will, um, I steer clear of Salem a little bit because most people know a lot about Salem. So I wanted to include people who maybe don't get mentioned as often or cases that aren't as well known. So this is witchcraft in colonial America. <clears throat> As history, witchcraft is in large part women's history. Fear of witchcraft traveled to the shores of America on the ships that brought the Puritans. And it was the source of at least four onboard executions of women just between 1655 and 59. The female to male ratio of the accused was high, but early on in some areas where accusations were leveled at women, actually charging them with witchcraft was rare. The number of women living in the outlying areas was low compared to men, and that created reticence to charge the women that they do have as witches. Witchcraft incidents picked up in the 1640s, uh, concurrent with a surge in England, where between 1645 and 47, several hundred people were hanged. 90% of those were women. In North America, women represented 80% of those executed for witchcraft. The first execution in the colonies was that of Alice Young on May 26, 1647 in Windsor, Connecticut. No record of the charges that were brought against her survives. Um, we do know that she had no sons at the time of her trial and execution, and this will become a trend through the next few decades. The history of witchcraft in North America goes back to when Spain's presence was spreading north. And I'd like to touch on this briefly since it, it played a part in the expectations that the English colonists had before they ever arrived in the Northeast. Early accounts by the Jesuits who came to convert the natives were circulated throughout Europe and Britain pretty extensively. From those, it can be quite difficult to get an accurate depiction of the spiritual practices of the Native Americans, but they did have a profoundly rich culture that included healing and blessings and protection ceremonies, most of which were done in a circle around the fire, which is also attributed to North American witches. But more often than not, um, the men who were documenting this culture did so with preconceived ideas that were shaped by their own religion, which was knee deep in devils and demons and all manner of evil influences. By the time the English were settling the Massachusetts Bay Area, they were primed to encounter what they feared most, and that's evidence of the devil. In 1590, the Jesuit Jose de Acosta wrote that Europe had so successfully eradicated the devil from their most noble territories that he had fled to North America because while it was vast in size, it was remote. The New World was viewed by many as the physical residence of the devil. A contingent of clerics who were setting sail from England to come to Jamestown received a bon voyage pep talk by Protestant minister William Crashaw, who assured them the devil would be displaced from North America even though, quote, Satan visibly and palpably reigns there more than in any other known place of the world, end quote. Spain had spread Catholicism throughout South America and instilling Protestant doctrine in North America was viewed by the English as a competition. Any failure of conversion was clearly influenced by Satan, his demons, and of course, witches. Most of the colonists of New England were Puritans, who saw pride as the primary indicator of consorting with the devil, since pride was the sin of the fallen who dared to challenge God. The Malleus Maleficarum, or the Hammer of Witches, discusses at length the vileness of the creature known as woman. According to the Malleus, women, quote, knew no moderation in goodness or vice, end quote. The book put forth the belief that women were weak-minded and quoted a line from a play by Seneca the Younger, when a woman thinks alone, she thinks evil. This opinion persisted 
through the medieval period and traveled along with the colonists. Any glint of pride in a woman uh, put her on thin ice. Combined with the belief that the devil's new digs were in North America, these ideas fortified the intense dread and expectation of witchcraft in the earliest colonists, long before Salem's ordeal took place. The clergy warned men to be vigilant because pride affects weak-minded women who are coerced into resistance because they are controlled by the devil. The Jesuit writings, the Malleus and the uh, King James's book, Demonology, combined to start the proverbial ball rolling before the first English colonists set foot on the shore of New England. And adding to that turmoil was publication of the discovery of witches by Matthew Hopkins in 1647. That was the same year that Alice Young was hanged. The Witchfinder General's witch hunting advice and practices were incorporated into the teaching of law in England. Any religious resistance, female independence, or ill luck was deeply ingrained as a sign of witchcraft. So two main co uh, concerns regarding witchcraft existed in colonial America. Everyday colonists were more concerned with maleficium, which is the harm a witch could do to them, their property, or their neighbors. The church focused on a witch as the enemy of God, an instrument of Satan who would recruit others to the dark side and with the intention of destroying churches. It's worth a look at the religious underpinnings of the colonists to help understand the witchcraft stranglehold. Most were Puritans and stern religious beliefs contributed to their communities being susceptible to fears of witchcraft. While well meant, their doctrine could sometimes be self-defeating. All were expected to adhere rigidly to the scriptures at all times. Even doing so, the status of their immortal soul could never be assured and required constant vigilance throughout their life. A depressing aspect of this was that they also believed that not everyone could be or even, uh, you know, that would be or even could be saved. Salvation was predestined and only those who were elected by God would go to heaven. And God already knew who these people were before they were born. To complicate matters, uh, knowing if one was elected was not easy to figure out and it created intense uncertainty. God's grace was impossible to earn, and yet ceaseless self-examination was required throughout life. Membership in the Puritan church was attained only when a candidate could testify they had detected signs of God's grace in their life. Once a man was a member of the church, he had full power to interpret the Bible, determine God's will, and the fate of anyone who failed in the church's eyes. Some Puritans became almost neurotic over the pressure to live as perfectly as possible, which I could understand. Adding to the stress was the notion that declaring oneself worthy of membership and then turning out to be wrong was a grave sin. It's easy to see how acceptance of enchantment became a, a knee-jerk reaction to misfortune the blame being cast on someone else in hopes of shielding their own soul. As cruel and merciless as accusations made on the feeble, elderly, and sick of, of the community were, this tug of war between am I saved or am I lost helped create some self-defensive callousness toward their fellow villagers. Prior to 1656, most women were of the poorer class and shared similar common factors like being single, widowed, or just a disagreeable curmudgeon in the neighborhood. But there were other situations that made a woman vulnerable. Ladies with a quirky, eccentric, or outspoken nature were first to be scrutinized. In a 1653 sermon, New Haven clergyman John Davenport said, a forward, discontented frame of spirit was a good subject fit for the devil to work upon. The word discontent here was used as meaning the feeling that one belonged in a higher station in the social order than where they were. And they viewed this as a form of that really, really dangerous trait, pride. It was believed to affect mainly women since they were often displeased with their material conditions. And this naturally drew them to Satan. The, these are all John Davenport's opinions, and that's where they felt they could secure prosperity 
and leisure. As you might guess, it didn't take long for parishioners to start detecting this very trait in their neighbors. Elizabeth Godman was one of them. A woman of substantial means, uh, she had neither brothers nor sons. She was, as described by author Carol Carlson, in the category of women who stood in the way of ordinary, the orderly transmission of property from one generation of males to another. Elizabeth lived in the household of then deputy governor of New Haven, and his name was Stephen Goodyear. He remarked that he had seen her, quote, fling herself out of a room, end quote, following his reading from the Bible. He reported her as saying it was because she liked it not, but said it was against her. A William Hook said Elizabeth was bitter that a man she wanted had married another. Echoing Davenport's words, Hook went on to say that after begging beer from him, Godman had walked away, quote, in a muttering, discontented manner, end quote, just because it had not been newly drawn beer. Elizabeth was from a wealthy family that had no male heirs, and she was the inheritor of a substantial estate, but being female, her estate and all her money was turned over to Stephen Goodyear for management thus her living in his household. She was forced to ask for, even beg for at times, things that she needed, even though the money was her own. It isn't hard to see how this caused her to uh, be discontent due to the injustice rather than pride necessarily. Elizabeth was credited with a wide variety of actions, including sexual relations with the devil, causing miscarriages, and possessing knowledge she couldn't possibly have. Her mischief did not stop there. Elizabeth enchanted people, cattle, and chickens. She spoiled butter and she soured beer. She endured two court hearings in 1653 and 55. The court was disappointed at the results saying, quote, the evidence is not sufficient to take away your life, end quote. So her movements within the community were severely restricted and she was ordered to pay 50 pounds as surety for her future good behavior. Women known as local cunning women in their home country might become herbalists in the new country to steer clear of that witchy aspect. Women who use their skills to supplement the family income, whether by making medicines, soap, or weaving, were susceptible to accusation since they were viewed as competition to men who engaged in the same vocations. Now, particularly at risk were midwives who were essential members of every community. But what made them important made them vulnerable. Childbirth was uncertain at best, and the Puritans believed stillborn children and those who died early were doomed to hell. It was a paradox that the same group of people who believed everyone's future was preordained by God believed that a newborn went to hell because it died before it could redeem itself through contemplating and correcting its sinful nature. So a less than well-liked midwife, a uh, neighbor perceived as jealous, or someone with an outspoken attitude could become the focus of a couple who had lost a baby, especially if there was an ax to grind between them. The other side of the coin was not much of an improvement. If a midwife successfully managed a very difficult birth, it might create suspicion she was a witch because the birth was unlikely to have gone well without supernatural help. So under these circumstances, a litany of life events contributed to accusations. The ever-present reality of death, high infant mortality, harsh winters, crop failure, disease among livestock, a lost tool, a shadow seen in the lamplight. Literally anything that could go wrong or was unusual was fodder for suspicion. Puritans believed any honorable work was giving praise to God which led to seeing the devil in anything that kept their work from prospering or was made more difficult, no matter how mundane. Something as simple as a, a broken wagon wheel or some wool robing that they were having a lot of trouble spinning for whatever reason, that was suspect. With all the other things colonists had to worry about in order to survive, it must have been exhausting to deal with sketchy salvation on a daily basis 
Disbelief in witchcraft was dubious, and the poor soul who expressed doubt put him or herself at risk of joining the accused on the stand. A person who associated with, lived nearby, defended, or questioned any of the proceedings in the trial of a witch could draw suspicion upon themselves as being in league with the devil. One example is Mary Stapley's, accused as a witch by Roger Ludlow because she did not readily accept the decision of the New Haven court that her neighbor, Goody Knapp, that's K-N-A-P-P, -P, was a witch. Worsening her situation, Mary had said she wasn't satisfied there were any witches at all. So this put her into the spotlight as a witch. <clears throat> Servants and slaves were often accused. Margaret Hawks owned a slave named Candy who came from, uh, to Salem from Barbados. She was accused by Ann Putnam and Mary Walcott of bewitching them with puppets. Puppets that someone could either burn or comparable to voodoo dolls that you could stick pins in. Uh, Candy was interrogated on July 4th, 1692 and admitted to signing a book with her mark and showed the questioner the poppets that she used in her torment. The appearance of these poppets drew violent fits from the girls, as a lot of things did during the Salem witch trials, and they claimed that Goody Hawks also participated in tormenting them along with a black male servant. Uh, Candy's testimony, while very clearly submitted as a confession, which it basically was, whether it was true or not, was disbelieved by the jury and Candy was acquitted. By 1656, women of the higher social orders were no longer immune by virtue of their status. Women who inherited money or property and were well respected began to suffer the same accusations as their poorer counterparts. An early example is Anne Hibbins, widow of a magistrate. She was afforded the honorific of Mrs. as a mark of respect that the community held for her based on her husband's previous service as a magistrate and also as a businessman. Anne inherited a significant estate from her husband. The couple had settled in Boston in the 1630s and they were well known, but Anne wasn't particularly well liked. She was an extroverted personality, um, spoke her mind more than was generally accepted. Very shortly after her husband died, uh, Anne evidently made an unfortunate remark that two women she saw whispering in the street were talking about her, and they were. The fact that she had guessed this was viewed by her acquaintances as preternatural knowledge, knowledge that no normal woman could possibly have without the help of a demon. You couldn't just deduce that from watching them. In May of that year, Anne was accused of witchcraft based on this alone. Despite her home being thoroughly searched for witchy paraphernalia and none discovered, and her body examined for witch's marks, none were found, she went to trial. So what was the beef against Anne Hibbins? None of the evidence given at her witch trial survives, but her history does, her prior history. In Boston in 1640, Anne initiated a lawsuit against the joiners that she'd hired to work on her home uh, for their high charges versus poor quality. In the beginning, she had some support from other local joiner, joiners who agreed with her. When she failed to meekly submit to the court and instead continued to pursue her petition, her supporters turned and joined forces against her for trying to subvert the minds of men to her own. John Cotton said Anne had lied about the circumstances and was trying to thrust herself into God's throne to know the hearts of men. Cries of blasphemy sounded and Anne Hibbins was guilty of great pride of spirit because she refused to acknowledge her duty to obey God and men. She was ordered by the church elders, not the court, but the church elders, to submit to the court and the joiner services without any further questioning. Basically, it was shut up and pay up. Don't talk about it again. Anne had questioned men. Deacon Thomas Oliver pronounced her leprous and unclean. Not only did she lose her suit, but she was formally excommunicated from the church. Anne's first trial resulted in a guilty verdict. 
probably because of her status, the magistrates overseeing the trial were uncomfortable with that, and they rejected the verdict and ordered a retrial. The second trial returned the same guilty verdict. With nothing left to do but honor the jury's decision, the wealthy widow Anne Hibbins was hanged in Boston in June 1656. Only one minister stated that Anne Hibbins had been executed as a witch for, quote, having more wit than her neighbors, end quote. Her spirit and financial independence were her undoing. The execution of 20 people in Salem in 1692, and I'm counting the pressing death of Giles Corey, compri comprised the largest group executed in one place. Salem signaled the decline of the witch hunts, but not the last. Between 1620 and 1725, of the 355 people who were accused of witchcraft, 103 went to trial. There were accusations in the other colonies, but far fewer. There was no lack of accusation, though. Many types of protections were used against witches and evil spirits. One method brought from Britain was the witch bottle. Now, the purpose of a witch bottle was to break a curse that someone felt a witch had placed on them. And it was meant to turn the magic back on the witch and either expose her as a witch or kill her, which would maybe also expose her. An artifact was found by the William and Mary Center for Archaeological Research in Williamsburg in 2016 during widening of Interstate 64. The crew uncovered remains of a hearth built during the Civil War by Union troops at Readout 9, the remains of which are now in the median of that interstate. Buried next to the hearth was a green glass bottle which contained a clump of iron nails. This find as a witch bottle is but a theory, but one that is favored and is bolstered by its location. Hearths and chimneys were frequently the site of protections against witches who were thought to enter a home through the chimney. It was believed that the fire would heat the nails and that would draw the witch's spirit into the bottle and then the iron would trap her there. The bottle um, is embossed on the outside and it says uh, it was made in Pennsylvania between 1840 and 1860 and the lettering says Charles Grove of Columbia, PA. It may not have been a witch, the person who buried it feared, but rather maybe falling back on some homespun folklore about protecting oneself at a time when it clearly was greatly needed. Uh, evidence of this practice in the colonies is clear by the 1979 discovery of a witch bottle next to the foundations of a 17th century house in the Great Neck area of Virginia Beach. Buried upside down, it contained pins and nails. And witch bottles often contained urine, hair, nail clippings, and any iron objects. Accounts of this particular bottle suggest it could have been used against Grace Sherwood, a woman frequently pulled into court on charges of witchcraft between 1698 and 1706. One of the many accusations against her was that she tormented a neighbor, and I believe it was a female neighbor, during the night, preventing her from sleeping, and then escaped through the keyhole in the shape of a black cat. Grace was the only woman in Virginia to be convicted as a witch through trial by water. Her appearances in court began with lawsuits for slander that she and her husband brought against various neighbors who had accused her of witchcraft. <clears throat> Grace lost all her slander suits in court. And then the death of James, her husband, in 1701, left her alone to fend off the accusations. Um, she did win a trial in uh, December, on December 7th in 1705 for trespass and assault and battery. Uh, this was against Elizabeth Hill, who had come onto her property, onto Grace's property, and assaulted, bruised, maimed, and barbarously beat Grace. Elizabeth was fined 20 shillings, but she and her husband Luke would just continue to be a thorn in Grace's side. Unable to let it go, the Hills summoned Grace to court again the next month, again on accusation of witchcraft. Grace failed to appear, but was ordered to appear at the next court on February 7th. And in that session, Luke Hill reaffirmed his complaint that Grace bewitched his wife 
and Grace was ordered to submit her body to being searched for witch marks by a jury of 12 women. The forewoman of which was Elizabeth Barnes, who was a woman previously named in a slander suit by the Sherwoods in 1698. The search, the jury stated that they found, quote, two things like tits with several other spots, end quote. With a finding considered tantamount to a guilty verdict, future sessions for this case were moved to the Council of Virginia in Williamsburg, who swiftly passed it on to the Attorney General, uh, Stevens, Stevens Thompson. Thompson gave his report on April 16th, saying the accusations were too generalized for him to rule upon, and he promptly tossed it back to the court of Princess Anne County stating it was up to them to investigate de novo, which means from the beginning, from scratch, with a new trial. On May 2nd, the county court decided Anne was just too dangerous to remain free, so she was taken into custody and put in shackles. The constable and sheriff were ordered to search Grace's home and property, including all suspicious places for anything that could be used to strengthen the witchcraft charge. The court also ordered a jury to be assembled of women to again search Grace's body and give anything against her in evidence. This time, the women requested declined to do so, and they also did not appear in court when they were expected. It doesn't say what happened to them for contempt, other than they were cited for contempt. On June 6th, Queen's Counsel Maximilian Bush made statements against Grace on behalf of Queen Anne and Luke Hill spoke against Grace and swore on that evidence. In spite of that, still unable to persuade the women to search Grace, the Flummox court decided that ducking was the only way to resolve the verdict. In ducking, also called swimming or trial by water, a woman was bound and tossed into deep water. If she sank, she was innocent, but guilty if she floated. The premise was that water, considered pure, would reject the devil and repel the witch, out of the water. It, it would not accept her, but it would accept the innocent. To us, that seems like a remarkably poor way to arrive at a verdict, as the risk of drowning the innocent is very real. This was not lost on the colonists, but was a risk they were willing to take, and men were usually provided to be at the ready to pull the woman out of the water, regardless of whether she sank or swam. The test was not necessarily indicative of colonist ignorance, um, which is easy to assume. Uh, when faced with the inability to make a determination based solely on coincidence and circumstantial evidence, they saw the water trial as a way of asking God to sort out something just unprovable by mortal men. The following quoted text is the court order for Grace's trial by water and includes the original wording and lack of punctuation. So if it sounds like a run-on sentence, it is. And 10th of July, 1706. Now Grace was crossbound, right wrist to left foot, left wrist to right foot. The court ordered the sheriff, quote, take all such convenient assistance of Bowdoin men as shall be by him thought fit to meet at Jonathan Harper's plantation in order to take the said Grace forthwith and put her into the above man's depth and try her how she swims, therein having care of her life to preserve her from drowning. And as soon as she comes out, that he requests as many ancient and knowing women as possible he can to search her carefully for all teats, spots, and marks about her body not usual in others, and that as they find the same to make report on oath to the truth thereof to the court. And further, it is ordered that some women be requested to shift and search her before she go into the water, that she carry nothing with her to cause any further suspicion." End quote. Now, this document doesn't specifically say if Grace floated or sank, but she did survive her swimming. Uh, follow the ducking, following the ducking, she was searched by five women who declared on oath that, quote, she is not like them nor no other woman that they knew of, having two things like tits on her private parts of a black color, probably moles, uh, being blacker than the rest of her body, end quote. The court considered this evidence and found her guilty of witchcraft. 
Grace was ordered to be taken into custody, her body committed to the common jail, where was she, she was to be secured by irons. She was imprisoned until uh, somewhere around 1714. They don't give an actual date. Uh, at that time, she was released. She pay, paid her back taxes and returned to her farm. And she lived there quietly without any further trouble until she was 80 years old. And she was the only woman in Virginia to have been convicted by swimming. On July 10th, 2006, 300 years to the day, then Virginia Governor Tim Kaine pardoned Grace Sherwood and restored her good name. A statue of Grace stands at the intersection of Witch Duck Road and Independence Boulevard in Great Nick, Virginia. When did the colonist brand of witchcraft end in North America? Has it really? Vestiges remain. Have you ever crossed your fingers? Sorry about that. Hung a horseshoe over a door. Picked a four-leaf clover. All remnants of the protections the colonists believe in. Accusations were not heard often, although in the last couple of years, an ac accusation was made that witches across the U.S. were working together to harm a politician. Remains of the fear that women will try to usurp a man's power. A little bit more recent than the colonies, but not not exactly contemporary, the Princeton Indiana Daily Clarion reported on August 15th, 1913, that in Frankfort, Kentucky, a charge of witchcraft was alleged by the family of 24 year old Mrs. Lily Harp, who died of tuberculosis. The family insisted she had been hoodooed to death. Now, hoodoo is a type of folk magic treatments, uh, herbal lore that is central to the Appalachian area. Lily's mother, Margaret Kubert, discovered a pair of feather stockings inside the girl's pillow on which she died and declared them the work of a witch who cast a spell on not only Lily but on her infant who had died the previous year. Lily's husband Thomas told the paper he was visiting a Floyd Street clairvoyant in Louisville that day to participate in a ritual expected to kill the witch. Mrs. Kubert said they would be boiling witches' wreaths while stabbing them with a fork. It doesn't say what the wreaths were made of, but it possibly could have been of elder because that was a very common wood and even branches that were used in England to ward off witchcraft. And also to protect a home, they used to plant an, um, an elder tree by the front door. For New Englanders, the taste for witch trials and executions declined rapidly after Salem. It was widely acknowledged by residents, the judiciary, and the clergy that many people who were innocent had been killed. Testimony of the possessed, confessions of alleged wishes, and claims of spectral sight, as well as maleficium, were all discounted and disallowed as evidence in trials. And without these, there just wasn't a basis for a trial. The history of witchcraft still captures the interest of many people today, and the accusations may never quite vanish like that cat through the keyhole. So that is my talk about witchcraft in the early colonies, and there is so much to it, so this is kind of skimming over a lot of it, but it, it raises a lot of interesting points. And thank you for listening.